If you put on a hard hat and a safety harness, grab a torch and go deep, deep, deep down into the basement of the Nielsen Company there on Headington Hill in Oxford, you'll find a pile of very impressive brown leather-bound books. And inside those pages, you will find the market share data from 1949. Now, if you're interested in the longevity of brands like I am, the 1949 is a pretty good place to start. Partly because there's some data to look at, but also because in many ways it marks, marks the start of the race. The war was over, rationing was starting to be relaxed, but it's just before the TV advertising of the 1950s or the rise of the all-powerful supermarkets. So the first book I looked at contained the market share information for the breakfast cereal market. So, I have a question for you. Can you guess the top three selling breakfast cereal brands of 1949? Ready? Correct. Number one, Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Number two was Weetabix. And number three, no, not Rice Krispies. Number three was, was actually it was shredded wheat. But, but the point is, all three of those brands are still household names today. In fact, for the 30-year period between 1949 and 1979, Weetabix only changed its market share position by 0.1%. Imagine all those marketing directors, all those sleepless nights, all those big, big decisions, all those brand managers, all to move the market share position by a tenth of 1%. So, how do big brands stay big? I think it's obvious. Big brands stay big because, well, because they do. People buy what they know, they know what they buy, they have the distribution, they have the economies of scale, they have the shelf space, they have the product heritage, they're good quality, they're consistent over time. Cadbury's cup and a half of milk has been poured into the dairy milk bar chocolate for 70 years. The Budweiser label is almost identical to the label of 1870. Easily identifiable when you're three lanes back at the bar, omnipresent in every fridge in the country. Ah, but not so fast. Back in the basement. The next brown leather book I looked at contained the market share information for shampoo in 1949. So now, who can tell me three of the top selling shampoo brands of that year? <laughs> Not so easy now. Would you have guessed Evan Williams? Dreen? Ikilma? Ikilma was the brand that urged you to wash your hair every week, whether you needed it or not. In fact, the truth is, all the big sh shampoo brands of 1949 had completely disappeared by 1979. They were replaced with brands like Silvercreen and Sunsilk in the 1970s. And yet these brands have now, in turn, been swept away by Tresemme and John Frieda and the like that we see in our supermarkets now. So, ah, it would seem that some big brands stay big and some don't. Actually, there were 11 of those books, and I won't take you through and make you guess each one, but I looked at the top three brands in each of those 11 categories. So I looked, obviously, at a total of 33 brands. And of those 33 brands, only eight of them had stayed in the top three across those two generations. And only two of them had stayed at number one. Now remember, we are talking about the unassailable brands, the dominant category players, with the heritage, with the shelf space, with the distribution network. And yet, less than one in four of them survived as a brand leader. I think that's a sobering thought for brand managers of brands like Airwick or Stella Artois today. Perhaps they should take an afternoon off and go and talk to the former brand managers of brands like John Player Special or Del Monte Fruit Juice or SR Toothpaste and ask them, what happened? SR Toothpaste, of course, was the brand that appeared in the very first TV advert in 1955 and which is now almost extinct in the UK. Ah, for interest, the two brands that stayed number one were Rye Vita and HP Source. So well done you, top of the class.